Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Rina Terber from the IEC Central Office in Geneva. I am pleased to welcome you to our webinar today on part one of the IEC ISO directives, which describes the procedures for IEC technical work. So our speaker today is Pierre Seblin, Technical Department Manager at the IEC. During his presentation, which will last about 20 minutes, participants will be on listen mode only to avoid any background noise. You will have the opportunity to ask your questions during the Q&A session. If you wish, you can also send me your questions through the chat function at any time from now onward. So Pierre, uh, I now hand it over to you. Okay, so thank you very much, Rina. Uh, I'd like to say hello to everybody and good morning or good afternoon. And uh, so I will move forward now with this presentation, which uh, in fact intends to present you the directives, um, to really give you a global overview of the directives, and then I will we will dive into some specific uh, uh, aspects or specific issues that are maybe a little more close to. Um, uh, the concerns of the national committees. So let's move forward. So first of all, we'll have a. I will just make an overview of all the reference documents because we don't have only directives in order that to understand uh, mainly what are these documents uh, used for. Then I will uh, deal about the organizations of the directives in a way it's uh, how the documents are structured. Then we'll really go diving into part one and, and the IC supplement. Then we will support, uh, discuss about how, uh, um, how to get support on the directives. And also we'll discuss about specific items for the national committees and then we'll have the question and answer session. So first of all, uh, here we have, this is the website page that you, you have the link at the bottom here. And so on that page, you will see uh, most of the documents that we have available. Uh, basically, we have, first of all, that document which is called the statutes and um, the, ST, the statutes and rules of procedures. And this document uh, defines the membership, uh, what is the membership of the IC in a way that what kind of members we have as national committees, what's the organization of the IEC, how it works, what are the management rules, what is the council supposed to do, the SMB supposed to do, the CAP supposed to do, and so on. And what are also the, you know, the, the officers of the executive committees supposed to do, and so on. So this is really a general document. Then the second document is uh, the Directives Part 1. So this Part 1 of the Directive is, uh, in fact, the part which is uh, common to ISO and IEC. Then we have uh, the Supplement, which is called IC, ISO IEC Directives, IEC uh, Supplement. And this Supplement contains all the processes and the procedures that are specific to the IEC. So the ones that are not common between ISO and IEC. Then there is another document, which is the consolidation of part one and IEC supplements. So there you will really have some kind of a single document into which you have all the processes that are for the IEC. There's also the part two that we won't discuss uh, today. Uh, it's also common to ISO and IEC, and it's focused on, I would say, the principles and the rules for the drafting of uh, the ISO and IEC documents. So this is everything about drafting standards. There's also another document, which is the uh, procedures which are specific to ISO IEC GTC1, because GTC1 has some kind of specific procedures and there is a document to summarize these procedures. This is not the subject of our discussion today. The basic agreement, this is a document that uh, describes the responsibilities and duties of a secretariat. We will really not, we will not go into that document, although we'll 
I would say, briefly discuss about the dis responsibilities and duties of a secretariat, but we'll not really go into that document specifically. And the last document in that page is the guide uh, for hosting uh, TC meetings, and this document contains guidelines for secretariats hosting plenary meetings. So this is to give you really an overview of all the documents for that, uh, that are available on that uh, web page. So now let's focus on the directives part one. So this directive, this document is in fact a common document jointly developed by ISO and IEC. The latest edition is the edition 12 that was published in May 2016. And this edition, like uh, we said the, pre the last previous editions, includes also a headline version. This means that you have in that document, whether you have it on a PDF or in a paper form, the first uh, part of the document is the plain, the plain directives, and the second part is uh, the exact same uh, text, but you will see what has been changed from, uh, from edition 11 to edition 12, and this will be marked in red. So you have, in fact, two directives into the same document one which is the final version and one which shows the changes from the previous version. So now let's go through the uh, uh, table of content of the part one. So first of all, this part here, uh, which is from the item 1.5 until um, the, uh, I would say, the uh, items uh, 1.14. This part of the directives, this is where you will find uh, all the information regarding technical committees and subcommittees. How to establish a, com a committee, a technical committee, how to establish a subcommittee, how to nominate the secretariat and choose the secretariat and vote on it, how to nominate the chairs and vote, how to establish new working groups, establish other groups and all these questions. So you will find answers to these questions into that part of the directives. Then in that part here, you, you will find all the aspects that deal with the liaisons. So you will see here uh, how to establish liaisons between technical committees, how to establish liaisons between ISO and IEC committees, and also how to establish liaisons uh, with other organizations. And you will see, find here what are the criteria which are needed to be able to establish a liaison with the IEC for an external organization, and also the uh, three types of liaison that are offered, which are the category A, B, and D liaisons. Then this is one of the major part of the directives, which deals with the standards development process. So here in the, uh, in the clause two, of uh, the directives, you will find all the information about how to develop standards and all the processes. So you will have uh, some kind of a general introduction and then you will have, uh, I would say, a description of the project stages and also how uh, you know, how to have, what are the conditions to accept new projects, uh, the link with the program of work. Also, uh, you will have uh, some information about uh, the project management and so on. And then, uh, if you start on the uh, with the uh, item 2.2, you will have here the description about the preliminary stage. And then you will go through all the stages, the proposal stage, preparatory stage, committee stage, inquiry stage, and approval stage, and publication stage. So you will see here in the directives all uh, description of the details of the processes, what has to be done, 
what should the secretariat do, what should the secretary do, what should the uh, chair do, uh, what are the uh, ballots that have to be done, what are the conditions to have the ballots approved, to move one stage to the other, who takes the, makes the decision and so on. So this is in that part that we really discuss in details the uh, standards development process. The next part of the directives uh, deals with the maintenance aspects. So here you will see, uh, uh, you will have uh, detailed information about how to do maintenance and also uh, you will have uh, how to do amendments, corrigandums, uh, new additions and so on. Okay. Then uh, the other part, uh, the part three, which uh, the title is development of, of other deliverables. This is, where you, this is where you will find all the information if you want to develop technical report, technical specification and PAS, publicly available specifications. Then the next important part into the directives is the part four, which deals with the meetings. So it deals mainly with the plenary meetings and it also address uh, some aspects of the working group meetings. Then you have the part five that deals with the appeals because some, in some cases national committees can do appeals on decision made, decisions made by technical committees and he, this is where you can find also here specific information on that subject. And there here in that Annex B, this is also where you will find uh, specific information about working jointly with ISO. Here. Then another uh, uh, important annex that you should also consider is the Annex D, which deals with the resources of the secretariats and qualification of secretaries. And there, in that annex, you will find the list of tasks and duties that are expected from national committees when it uh, decides to hold the secretariat of a technical committee. There in uh, the uh, annex uh, F, you will find here the options for developments of a project and basically in the F1 you have a simplified di diagram of, of options and this is uh, I think a quite a very good um, I would say summary of all the various options and processes that we can use to develop standards and also technical reports and also technical specifications and so on. So I really also if you want to have a summary document about all the stages and processes this is a very good uh, annex to look at. Then we have another rather important part of the, uh, the directives, which is the patent policy and which is, which is addressed in the Annex I. And this is about it. Now let's go a little more uh, in details into the IEC supplement. So the IEC supplement is another document and it details all the procedures that are specific to IEC. The latest edition is the edition 10. It was also published last year in May and it also includes the red line version. The table of content of the IEC supplement has the exact same structure than the directives part one. Okay, this means that you will find exactly the same number of clauses with the same titles for the clauses. You will find clauses 1, organizational structure, 1.1, role of technical management board, and so on and so on. The only difference is that there are some additional annexes. We'll go through this in details later on. But when you look at the supplement, you can see here that in some cases, for example, for the, the clause 1.1, you will see that uh, the clause is called role of the technical management board and there is no text. This means that 
the text in the directive part one applies and there is no addition. If you look at the clause 1.5.12, there you see that there is some additional text in the supplement. This means that for the IEC, in addition to the text contained into the directive part one, you have to consider also the text contained in the supplement. And the global directives for the IEC are in fact a merge or an addition of the text in the part one and the text in the supplement. If you look at the table of content of the supplement, the IC supplement, you will see here these additional annexes I just uh, mentioned a few seconds uh, earlier. And you will see here we have, in fact, these annexes that are called SA, S annexes. So we have SA, SB, SC, all the way down to SP. These are specific annexes for the IEC. And the SA annex is a specific, a specific uh, annex about the review process. The review process is slightly different between ISO and IEC. And we have a flowchart that, describe uh, uh, that, that describes the IEC process. Then the PAS, uh, is a, a document which, a publication, which is specific to the IEC. And we have here the, plot, the, the description of the flow chart for the development of such a document. Then with the Annex SC is about uh, how to develop documents and publications. Oh no, this is about, uh, uh, in fact, how to include country specific exceptions into standards. And this is used by some technical committees, for example, TC64. Then uh, Annex SD is about how to develop uh, documents that uh, are dealing with uh, conformity assessment requirements. Then Annex SC is dealing with a transitional period. This means when you have published a new edition, uh, how do you handle the, this, the transition between the previous edition and the new edition? And here you can find guidelines about uh, how to handle this. Then SF, document distribution within the IEC, is not that uh, interesting. Reporting of secretariats within the IEC is not also that interesting. Then we have the IEC project stages. You have a list of all the stage codes there that can be interesting. Another one which is quite interesting is also the Annex SI about the numbering of documents. How should we number documents into the IEC? Then SG is uh, just a list of the forms names that are related to the trans development process. Then uh, the Annex SK is uh, dealing with the specific rules when uh, we want to develop a standard which is related to terminology, so which is an, um, an IEV uh, standard. Then uh, SL is about uh, the maintenance process uh, for the standard, uh, the database uh, format standards. And then we have Annex SM, which is uh, uh, dealing with the specific rules that we have in CISPER. SN is about the specific rules in TC100. Then Annex SO is uh, giving uh, the, uh, the voting and commenting periods. You know how many weeks you have to vote on an NP, on a CD, CD, VFDIS, and so on. And the last Annex is the SP, and it deals with the systems standardization. Then we have another document that I've mentioned initially that you can download, which is the Directive Part 1 with the Supplements. So this is in fact a compilation of the Part 1 together with the addition of the IC Supplement. So this is a merge. And you can see here in the table of content that you have some text in green 
where you have the added text. And when you go, for example, here, you see that in the maintenance of deliverables, you have a new clause, which is 2.9.1, uh, which is in page 40. And if you go into page 40, then you can see in, blue, in green text as well what has been added. When you read the directives, <clears throat> as the directives, they are uh, uh, expected to uh, be used by ISO and IEC technical committees, we have a set of generic terms. For example, the term generic term is national body that you can find into the directives. But when you are an ISO, in ISO, it means a member body. And when you are in IEC, it means, it means a national committee. In the directives, you will find the term technical management board. In ISO, it means the TNB, and in IEC, it means the SMB, the standardization management board, and so on and so on. So you have here in the table, in this table, which is in the foreword on page, page seven, seven uh, the, some kind of some terminology which, uh, which is specific for the directives. And if you, for example, have a look into the directives uh, and you read the close. 1.9.1 uh, about allocation, you can read the secretariat of a technical committee shall be like allocated to a national body by the technical management board. And when we're in the IEC, we have to understand that the national body means the national committee and the technical management board means the SMB. About reading the directives as well, when we for example, regarding the decision to be taken by the committee, this means the P members of the committee. So as an example, if you go to the clause 1.12.1, it says technical committees or subcommittees may establish working groups. This means that then uh, you, this is in fact a decision made by vote of the P members of the committee. Okay, and you can see here a working group shall report to its parent technical committee and subcommittee through a convener appointed by the parent committee. This means that, in fact, the technical committee or subcommittee to which that working group uh, is a part of, when we want to decide who will be the convener, this is going to be a decision made by vote of the P members. Working group committees shall be appointed by the committees here. This is here, and so on. Then we see also there <clears throat> the term national body, which is a national committee in the IEC. <clears throat> also, you have to uh, be aware that sometimes you maybe don't find uh, some issues that are really clearly or accurately defined into the directives. And very often, this has been left open intentionally. So you have to think that in a way that everything which is not forbidden is allowed in some ways in the directives. How to get support on the directives? This is the technical office of the central office for your committee, which is your primary contact for help and support about the use and the interpretation of directives. So when you want to, you have questions about uh, the directives, you have to check it about which committee is concerned and then contact the technical officer for this. So just do not hesitate to ask. And I also have uh, some specific items that I would like to just show uh, on, the um, on the directives. So first of all, I, uh, regarding the P and O membership, uh, in a technical committee and subcommittees, you can see the details of this in clause 1.7 on page 12. Regarding the secretariats of technical committees and subcommittees, you can see the details in the clause 1.8 and in the Annex D. And then regarding hosting committee um, um, plenary meetings, then you can also have a look at the clause 4.2 on page 37. And we have two other documents which are available on the website, uh, which are one is the guide for hosting TC meetings, and the other one is the meeting registration systems guide. So I just want to now go into the directives, uh, into these directives, and show you a few things about this. So, for example, if we go here, in uh, 
the page 12, we can see here the, the uh, clause 1.7, which is about the participation in the work of technical committees. And here we can see a detailed explanation of what are the commitments that a national committee is doing when it applies for P membership or O membership. You can see here, for example, that to participate actively in the work with an so P members, they participate actively in the work with an obligation to vote on all questions formally submitted for voting within the technical committee or subcommittee. On a new work items, proposal, inquiry drafts, final drafts for international standards and to contribute to meetings. So they have contributing to meetings mean, means sending delegates to the plenary meetings of the committee. If you apply for whole member, whole membership, then uh, you, have to, you have to follow the work as an observer and therefore to receive committee documents and you have the right to submit comments and to attend meetings. Okay. Another thing uh, which is maybe also important is that in fact uh, if you want to become P member or O member, or if you want to change between P membership and O membership into a committee, this is very simple to do for a national committee. The secretary of the national committee just needs to send an email to the technical officer informing that uh, he wishes to uh, become P member or O member in a committee. And this is set up, I would say, um, within a day or two uh, at the central office. This is the first part I wanted to uh, deal with. Then the second one is the close, uh, on the close I 1.8 about uh, the technical, oh, sorry. Yes, secretariats, this is the responsibility for the secretariat. So here you've got on 1.9, sorry, you have secretariats of technical committees and subcommittee, the allocation of secretariat. So here in that clause, you can find really more in details about how to allocate the, uh, the process to allocate the secretariat of a technical committee to a, a national committee and what are the responsibilities uh, for the national committees. Okay. I'd like just then also to show you the first page of that document. That document is, a, is called the Guidance for IC National Committees. You can also download it from the same page, web page I showed you here the first, uh, on the first slide. And there you have a three pages document that gives the details about how to organize plenary meeting for technical committees. And then I'd like just to show you this document, which is the Meeting Registration System Users Guide for the national committees that host meetings. And then you have the National Committee Administration Guide. And there also you find all the uh, key information to, uh, I would say, operate the meeting registration system as a national committee hosting a meeting. I would like to thank you for listening and I'm ready to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pierre. So the floor is now open to the participants. If you have a question, you can either use the chat function or click on the hand raising button in the control panel. I will then unmute you so that you can ask your question. Okay. So Pierre, I already have a, a question for you. Mm -hmm. So, what are the benefits of holding a TC secretariat and who covers the budget for the TC paperwork? Is it the NC who is responsible for holding the secretariat? Yes, so if you can, if you look, I didn't go into the details of the commitments that uh, take a national committee when it applies for holding the secretariat, but effectively this is to the national committee to provide the support of uh, the, the financial budget and the support, financial support of the secretariat activities. There's not that much, I think, uh, really involved, except that some in some national committees use, 
I would say, uh, their own employees as secretaries, and some national committees are looking for industry volunteers to uh, be the secretary of the, uh, of the committee. Okay, so basically, the, when a national committee hold, is holding the secretariat, then it, is, uh, it has the possibility to nominate the secretary. Okay, and this is its, uh, <clears throat> its own decision and choice. And the secretary in uh, the IC is the person who is, at the end of it, responsible for all the documents that are circulated by the technical committee, including the NPs and all the drafts and the final draft. This means that the secretary, in some ways, has really the final word on all the content of the standards of the technical committee. Also, the secretariat is also responsible to nominate the chair. So there is a process where the secretariat should seek the support of, of the other P members, but even if you have a vote uh, for an, a majority for a, a chair candidate, at the end this is a secretariat that selects the candidate and that decides who will be the chair. Of course, if you take and you decide for somebody who is not the one that had the majority when you submitted that to vote, then you have to provide, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a meaningful uh, justification. Okay. Did I answer the question? I think so. It was, uh, I received that question for the chat function, so... Right, okay. Any so, other questions? I see we don't have, there are no other questions, uh, so I think we will end the webinar now. It has okay. been a very interesting presentation and I believe we all go away with a better idea of the rules that guide IEC technical work. Pierre, do you have a final word before we end our session? No, I think uh, basically I think it's, uh, I really invite the people to uh, look into the directives and to be, I would say, to, to get used with this, to understand the structure, because if you start to really have a clear uh, overview of the structure of the directive, then it becomes very, very easy uh, to go through it and find information, definitely. And second, do not hesitate to contact technical officers. This is uh, their uh, work and their duty is to be aware of, uh, to have a deeper knowledge of the directives, to know how to make a proper interpretation of the directives. So do not hesitate also to contact the technical officers. This is so, it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. So the webinar has been recorded and we will share the recording and the slides with all participants. So goodbye, everybody.